Hello Foundation personnel, I'm Knox. Today, we'll be continuing our coverage of Ouroboros, the Cycle Proposal. If you have not yet been briefed on Part 1, The Children, or Part 2, The Broken God, you may wish to look back into the Foundation archives before continuing with this lecture. Without further introduction, let's begin. DJ Cactus Proposal, Ouroboros, The Cycle Proposal, Part 3, Atonement. Item Number SCP-001 Security Clearance Level 5, Top Secret Containment Class Keter Disruption Class Amida Risk Class Critical Archival Specifications This data file, being designated SCP-001, will exist separately from the decoy SCP-001 archive on the primary Foundation database and will be accessible only by closed units at Area 11 or Site-01. No other instances of this data file may exist. This data file is designed to corrupt any systems on which it exists that do not carry the encryption markers of either of those two systems. Special Containment Procedures SCP-001 is currently contained within the Petrikau Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array located on the 6th basement level of Armed Dimensional Containment Area 11, near Kunz, Norway. SCP-001's containment chamber must be kept at a temperature no greater than 3.2 Kelvin. A full contingent of research staff, as well as four applied task forces, are to be stationed at ADCA-11. Currently, those assigned task forces are ATF Indianapolis 13 Killboys, ATF Detroit 11 Blessed Rain, ATF Atlanta 9 Sherman's March, ATF Nevada 3 Firestarters. In addition to the standard construction of the Petrikau Fontaine Array, several significant modifications have been made since the discovery of SCP-001. The addition of three additional Ivory Cannon class liquid fluoride thorium reactors to balance additional energy loads, nine class six magnesium alloy suspension rings to maintain structural integrity of the array, 16 Scranton Kempf harmonic dampeners to control excessive energy output, three Polycott deflector dishes to control excessive energy output, eight Weldon Stanley fused energy sinks to control excessive energy output the construction of a deep well borehole to vent and control excessive energy output, one autonomously intelligent response vector to manage complex temporal spatial calculations. Should a destabilization event occur, the 40 days protocol is to be implemented. The acting site administrator will initiate a full evacuation of the facility, which will begin a 40 minute countdown. T minus 40 minutes, evacuation order is given. T minus 33 minutes, after a 7-minute evacuation window, sluice gates that run into the nearby river will open, flooding the lower portions of the facility. T-31 minutes. Charges situated around the test chamber will fire after 9 minutes, collapsing the test chamber and basement level into the deep well borehole. T-21 minutes. Additional charges set across the entire site will fire, collapsing the entire structure into the borehole. T-6 minutes. Charges set in the mountainside will fire causing a landslide that will fill and cap the deep well before being sealed by a set of locking plates designed to extend out over the full width of the borehole. T-0 minutes. The on-site nuclear device located at the base of the borehole will fire, destroying SCP-001. In the event that the 40 days protocol does not prove sufficient to destroy the anomaly, all designated foundation overseers, regional administrators, directors, and executives are to report to Overwatch Command, Site-01, and await implementation of the Tradesim protocol. Activation of the Tradesim protocol constitutes the beginning of a perdition-class dark body end-of-all-world scenario. All Foundation staff members will be alerted to the beginning of this protocol, which signals the immediate dissolution of the SCP Foundation and termination of all staff contracts. Due to the nature of a perdition class scenario, no additional information will be provided past the initial notice. For more information on the Tradisim protocol, see Addendum 0016. Updated Containment Memorandum This file has been classified Level 5 Overseer Eyes Only. All personnel remaining at Area 11 have been reassigned and amnesticized. All applied task forces have been reassigned and amnesticized. Management of containment will be handled solely by the NetZac system 
under overseer supervision. Identification and implementation of the 40 days protocol will be carried out solely by the NetZack system. No other personnel are authorized to view this file. Description SCP-001 is a humanoid gravitational singularity currently contained within the Area 11 Petrikow Fontaine array. SCP-001 is immeasurably dense. Only by mitigating its effect on space-time through the use of a Scranton Kempf device are Foundation personnel able to maintain the structural integrity of the spatial stabilization array. SCP-001 is not visible without specialized equipment, usually high-contrast infrared cameras, as it is constantly surrounded by a dense cloud of radioactive gas and atomized debris. Additionally, being a singularity, SCP-001 does not reflect light, and is visible only by the obfuscation of light around it. SCP-001 is capable of manipulating the nature of reality through alterations in gravity that change the shape and structure of space-time. As such, its anomalous capabilities cannot be dampened by anything other than the Petrikow Fontaine Array. Any alterations to space-time made by SCP-001 are irreversible. Addendum 001-1 Initial Manifestation on June 19, 1982, a team of Foundation researchers headed up by Dr. Lamar Fontaine were in the process of running engineering trials on the Petrikow Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array, a device intended for use in containing anomalies that manipulate the nature of space-time. During these trials, a particle accelerator was used to create super-heavy organicin, which would in turn collapse on itself to create a miniaturized singularity. This procedure had been carried out on several other occasions with each of the singularities destabilizing quickly after manifesting. The June 19th trial was intended as a scale-up test of the procedure. Shortly after 2030 hours local time, the particle accelerator was in the process of spooling up. Dr. Kelvin Desmet, one of the project's research assistants, noted minor power fluctuations in one arm of the array's stabilizing rings. Dr. Desmet wanted to replace the failing coupling, which was known to decay under the cold temperature of the testing chamber. Since the test was still an hour away and the chamber was not sealed, Dr. Desmet entered to repair the coupling. As the accelerator continued to spool, a power regulator attached to the system's primary generator began to fail. Under non-test conditions, this event could still flood the chamber with ionizing radiation, so an evacuation order was given and the chamber was sealed. Dr. Desmet, not hearing the alert over the sound of the array coming online, due to the excessive power now present in the system, continued to work on the coupling. Roughly seven minutes later, while outside research staff were attempting to begin a power down cycle, the power regulator failed entirely and the accelerator began powering to near test conditions. Dr. Desmet abandoned the power coupling and attempted to escape the test chamber. Before he could make it to an emergency exit, the accelerator reached peak test conditions and a singularity formed. The array pulled the singularity into alignment, but only milliseconds before the damaged stabilizer arm failed and Dr. Desmet was exposed to the naked singularity. The test chamber collapsed into the singularity, as did much of the rest of the research wing and Dr. Desmet himself. Shortly afterwards, the singularity dissipated. In the wake of the June 19th incident, many administrative personnel at Area 11 were reassigned, while engineering staff and Foundation construction teams worked to repair the damaged portions of the facility, which was, at the time, still housing several other anomalies. This effort continued for several years, during which time significant control portions of the stabilization array were removed and replaced with autonomous systems, in order to reduce staffing and also to limit exposure. The engineering team assigned to the stabilizer began running tests of its capabilities starting in March of 1995. Over the next several years, the teams at Area 11 ran minor tests of the stabilizer, typically in an attempt to reduce energy requirements and increase automation. By 2002, the system was almost entirely automated, requiring only a handful of support staff to operate. The array began containing minor gravitational anomalies starting in 2004, and continued to do so full-time up until 2005. In late 2005, staff members at Area 11 began trials that would lead towards testing the stabilizer on a freestanding singularity. In early 2006, aided by the NetZack intelligence system, on-site engineers began scaling up their trials into fully operational experiments. After several months of testing, in May of 2006, the engineers at Area 11 manifested a singularity within the array at full power, and maintained the structural integrity of both the singularity and the containment chamber. However, after two hours of testing with a fully stable singularity, the space within the array began to change dramatically. The singularity began to rapidly grow in size, threatening to expand past the boundaries of the array. 
As the automated system initiated an evacuation warning, NetZack began making adjustments to account for the significant increase in energy being exerted by the Singularity. Eventually, the growth rate of the Singularity stalled, and the effects it had on the containment chamber were mitigated through alterations to the array's arrangement by NetZack. It was at this point that the thick cloud of rotating radioactive gas and dust formed, obscuring the Singularity within. As Foundation engineers began work to reinforce the damaged array, SCP-001 made its first attempt at communication with the Foundation staff. This initial communication attempt consisted primarily of unintelligible noises, eventually became full sentences, and then later conversations after Foundation personnel discovered that the singularity within the gas cloud was humanoid in shape and, though unmoving, clearly attempting to speak to them. Addendum 001-2 First Contact First contact between SCP-001 and the Foundation was conducted by Dr. J. Barton Ramsey, Site-17, at SCP-001's containment array beneath Area 11. Notably, SCP-001 does not appear capable of communicating naturally. Its incredible density makes the projection of sound impossible. Instead, SCP-001 uses gravity to vibrate the suspension rings of the array in order to create sound. Begin audio log. Just the microphone. Can it hear me? Wait, what was that? Can you hear that? Listen. Johannes. Johannes Ramsey. You know my name? He... Yes. Johannes Barton Ramsey. You are a doctor. The S... SCP Foundation. Containment. Is he being contained? He can't see. He's the array. This is the Petri Cow Fontaine. He knows this place. He. Have you been here before? No. He. There is no I. Only he. Someone else. A man. I think I was him. Or he. He is me. He was here once. And then he wasn't. Jesus Christ. Is that Desmet? Who? Yes. Desmet. Calvin. His name was Calvin. Un unfortunately, there is no way for us to... The machine. The... Deactivate it. There is something he needs to do. He needs to... Needs to see. Needs... What are you? A... A way to distinguish between two like things. He needs an overseer. Overseers. All of them. Bring them here. That's against protocol. And no. They will come for this. He has something to offer them. What's that? A way out. End audio log. Addendum 0013. The way out. The following is the full log of O51's interaction with SCP-001. Begin audio log. To whom am I speaking? A technicality, I'm afraid. It took time to appear like this, and longer to, to manifest an identity. It almost seems unnecessary, but to simplify this means of communication, you may identify me as Calvin Desmond. That seems strange, applying characteristics to something wholly apart from their genesis. The same Kelvin Desmet, who was killed in this room 22 years ago. No, not the same. Similar in many ways, but changed. You understand, then, how far in breach of protocol we are? Yes, I think he would recognize that. But these are extraordinary circumstances. You mentioned a way out. Yes, in a manner of speaking. A way out of what? You contain the strange and anomalous because they threaten your world, but you're applying salve to symptoms. The root is entropy, something inevitable, something you cannot outrun, try as you might. Existence is an infinitely complex tapestry of realities, each neatly aligned above and below each other. Entropy frays the edges and things begin to leak through. How do you know this? I have seen it. Kelvin Desmet saw it, in the moment before his soul was cast into darkness. Everything you have contained, because you cannot explain it, comes from somewhere else, somewhere it can be explained. 
a different reality, one that seeps into yours. Entropy exacerbates this. Over time, the borders will disappear entirely, and your world, just like all worlds, will become a pandemonium of infinite realities competing for relevance over each other. Your world will die. All worlds will die. They will feast on each other as they suffocate and then they will die. This is not a hypothetical, it is an inevitability. You are certain. Beyond any doubt. How long do we have before this occurs? Decades. Each tiny tear puts pressure on the whole system. They will continue to grow until boundaries give way, and the moment the cascade begins, the fate of creation is decided. It will be unmade, and it cannot be undone. Not for you, perhaps, but your children and grandchildren will see a sky of nightmares before they die. What is your way out? Kelvin did the math in the moments before he entered the void. Order cannot exist forever in a universe that lingers on disorder. One line can stretch on forever, but infinitely many lines invites chaos, points that intersect. There is only one way to ensure this world's future, remove all other worlds. I don't understand. You are not expected to, because you cannot see the narratives. Kelvin could see them, for a moment. Kelvin saw Doomsday, and Kelvin reasoned a way out of it. Remove all narratives but this one, and you produce a creation of one. One universe, untarnished by the influences of others. Safe. Your loved ones protected from the enroaching darkness. Your children free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. By destroying all other realities. An incomprehensible loss of life. Yes. And you are capable of this. Yes. How? by removing the barriers for all realities, all at once, save this one. Compress space-time at the points where it is most vulnerable, and allow entropy to do the rest. If you are set on this path, why haven't you already done it? When I manifested here, this machine, I cannot see outside of it. I cannot see you. You must deactivate the machine. What is stopping any one of these infinite realities from inhibiting you in the same way? What is stopping them from realizing what we've done, and coming to destroy us? They will not realize what I have done until it is finished. End log. Shortly after the conclusion of this conversation, all staff members located at Area 11 were ordered to report to nearby sites for reassignment and amnesticization. Addendum 0014 Deliberations the Council has been called to hear arguments for and against the use of SCP-001 for the purpose of staving off the end of the world. 053, if you will. After investigation by several teams working independent of each other, we have determined that SCP-001 appears to be correct about what it has said regarding the nature of creation. The trend line of anomalies we are aware of and have contained has followed the accelerated progression that SCP-001 predicted. Based on our models, we should expect an uncontainable number of new anomalies within 30 years, and even more past that. Our best guess is that something big gets loose within 45, and at that point, there's nothing left to be done. How is that possible? How is it that the universe could fall apart as quickly as this entity says it will? According to Desmond, actions taken in other realities to stave off the end of their worlds have significantly damaged the metaphysical construction of all universes. In many ways, we are as much to blame as all of the others, but infinite blame spread over infinite responsible. Given a truly infinite multiverse, the idea of salvation coming to us and not another universe is... It is statistically impossible. Yes, yet no less impossible that it would come to any of them instead of us. How do we know this entity isn't lying to us? If it is, then it has an incredible grasp on high-level pataphysical concepts or something that hasn't directly experienced what it claims to have experienced. More than that, I took the liberty of consulting with a number of the precognitives and- That is forbidden. Wouldn't you want to know? We made a decision that cannot so easily be- We confirmed, as well as we could, that there is a point in time that is arriving soon that obscures their vision. They can see up to it, but not past. I don't even know if they realize it yet. It was only after we drew data from dozens of tests 
that we realized none of them have made a prediction past 2066. What if it's just a reality bender? What if we let it out of that array and it kills us all? If it was a reality bender, it would have done so already. This entity isn't manipulating Humes, it's manipulating gravity. Space-time. If it was affecting Humes, it could have just reached out and crushed us already. The stabilization array mitigates the effect of things that disturb space-time, which is what is currently keeping it at bay. This entity, Dr. Desmet, if he's actually in there, doesn't seem to be a type green. It's something wholly different. It's become something... fundamental to the nature of all things. I... If this creature is what it says it is, and it can do what it says it can do, that would mean the death of... of infinitely many lives. How can we just sit in judgment over so many living things? Who's to say the idea of other universes isn't anomalous? Maybe there should be just this one. Maybe that's the natural order. That is absurd! We. Oui. It still means the ends of so many lives. It's... it's too many to even comprehend. A number without limit. A number without us. We pledged ourselves to maintain normalcy and protect our world. This world. The affairs of other worlds are their own. We would expect any other Overseer Council to act the same way, in the interests of their universe. This. All of this. The science. The militarism. Everything. All of it is to accomplish a single unreachable goal. Keep the monsters tucked out of sight. Now we find out, even that might not be enough, that the end of days is coming for us anyway. But we're given an option. If we do nothing, every universe dies screaming. If we take this action, every universe dies screaming but ours. Once it's over, it's over. Everything we've struggled for, everyone who has died to protect our world, will be validated. Is the end of our road not worth this? Is protecting ourselves from the doomsday to come not worth this? I propose a vote. The utilization of SCP-001 Entity to stave off the end of the world. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. 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 O513 abstains. The measure passes. Even if we manage to somehow survive turning loose an unpredictable... monster, remember today as being the day we gave up on our mission. We secure and we contain. Those two come first. We've now risked everything for the faintest glimmer of hope that we somehow achieve the last, and I fear it will have damned us. Why do you trust it, Bramimund? After all we've achieved, why do you risk everything on this? I knew Calvin Desmet years ago, in a different life. He wasn't recruited by the Foundation. He volunteered. He was part of a team contracted by the Insurgency to run trials on new technology they were developing at the time. But he had a young daughter that was killed by SCP-106 when it breached containment during transit in 1975, years before we had developed functional containment procedures for it. And after that, he sought us out. He never said much about it, but you could tell. If that's him in there, and he had found a way to remove every trace of the anomalous from our universe, no matter the cost, he would do it. I know he would do it. I can hear it in his voice. Addendum 0015, The Deception. On January 11th, 2007, after further discussion with SCP-001 and additional independent research, the Overseer Council voted 8 to 4 to 1 to initiate a power down of the Spatial Stabilization Array and allow SCP-001 to take the action it had described. Three Overseers, 051, 054, and 0512, were in attendance. As a sign of good faith, an anomalous artifact, SCP-884, was selected and SCP-001 was directed to target the reality in which the artifact had originated. 053 oversaw the artifact during this process. Begin video log. 051, 4, and 12 stand alone in the Stabilization Array's control center. Visible on another screen is the dark cloud of gas and dust encircling SCP-001. 054 has a telephone in their right hand. They nod to 051. We're going to begin to step down the power running into the array. When we reach the agreed upon point, We'll hold it there until you can prove to us you can do what you claim. Do you understand? I do. 
O51 initiates step-down procedure. NetZack cycles down reactors 2 and 3. The cloud of radioactive dust and debris encircling SCP-001 falls into the borehole below it. Visible now as the light from the array is warped around it, it is a jet black humanoid entity. The entity does not move. This is it. Can you see me? I can see everything. Do you know what you're looking for? The mirror. Do it. SCP-001 does not seem to respond initially. Its position in the center of the array does not change. The world I see is not unlike your own. In that world, a dying soul attached itself to that mirror, a curse to whoever should own it. It has happened. There is a moment of silence, until 053 is heard over the radio. God. What is it? It's gone. It was sitting right here on the table, and then it just... It's like it folded in on itself until it was gone. There's nothing left. Was that you? That narrative has ended. How long will it take? Moments. Will it hurt them? It will be agony. The space around SCP-001 within the array begins to shimmer. Low, loud pulses of noise are emitted from the air around them, and the light within the chamber begins to bend in towards SCP-001. The array creaks and groans under the stress. 054 and 0512 step away from the observation window. 051 does not move. The building around them begins to shake. Points in the air around SCP-001 begin to distort, as if being dragged down individually towards SCP-001. The room darkens. More low pulses begin to rise up out of the borehole. A single, thin ring of white-hot debris begins to form around SCP-001. Others join it. Nearby, a klaxon can be heard as Netzak warns of intolerable load on the array. Does it hurt you? It is... excruciating. Suddenly, O51 jerks backwards. The space around his body begins to distort, as if being pulled in towards his center. He reaches forwards towards the observation window, his body compressing unnaturally. I don't... If that's him in there, and he had found a way to remove every trace of Anomalous from our universe, no matter the cost, he would do it. But Your children, free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. All traces must be removed. Every trace of the anomalous from our universe. This world must be washed clean. It is the only way out. <coughs> 051 collapses in on himself, folding and distorting down into a single point that hangs in the air for a moment and then disappears. All around the chamber, the walls begin to bend and distort. The air shimmers. 054 is lifted into the air, screaming, as her body begins to fold in on itself. Her eyes bulge and her bones audibly shatter. Another wave of force is emitted from within the stabilization array, and the observation window shatters. SCP-001 turns to look up at 054, who instantly crumples into a single point and then disappears. 0512 stands to flee, but is seemingly frozen in fear. There is a loud grinding sound, and then 0512 falls into the ground. From within the containment chamber, a loud hum is heard that grows considerably louder. SCP-001 is observed for a moment more staring up at the observation deck before it is surrounded by a cloud of dust and debris. As the array settles into position, the low pulsing sound dissipates and all that can be heard is the sound of Netzak's warning klaxon, signaling that it has activated an emergency failsafe. O-512 is heard sobbing in an unseen corner of the observation deck. SCP-001's voice begins to grind through the metal rings of the stabilization array. Your children free to live lives that do not end in horror, an end to your perpetual struggle, an end to darkness, the freedom to live in the light. All traces must be removed. This world must be washed clean. The Foundation does not escape atonement. It is the only way out. End log. Addendum 0016. Tradism Protocol. Okay, so this is stricken, but I will read it here. In the event that SCP-001 breaches containment, the Tradisum Protocol is designed to provide an extra-dimensional escape route for all high-ranking Foundation personnel to avoid annihilation at the hand of SCP-001. We were wrong. Tradisum is no longer an option. Every alternative must be considered. Sustained containment of SCP-001 is now the Foundation's only objective. More information will come to you as I receive it. 053. So that is the end of Part 3, Atonement at least the proposal part. However, 
There is another document here simply titled Moonrise, which seems to add some context. I'm not sure how this fits in with the whole picture of the proposal. It's written in more of a narrative way. I'm going to go ahead and read that for you now, and then you can decide for yourselves the relevance of it to what we have just covered. So let's begin. Moonrise. There is a dark room under a mountain in the far north where a man stands pressed against a corner. Something is spinning in the center of that room, something dark. He screams out his daughter's name before his body is pulled from the wall and into the darkness. There is an explosion and the room collapses. Years earlier, the man lies broken in an alley, the fire escape he had dropped from still ringing from the shock. Inches away from his grasp, a little girl looks at him with horror in her eyes, as she is approached by something that moves toward her slowly, one hand outstretched and fluid leaking from its empty eyes. The man reaches for the girl, but his body fails him. He is forced to sit and watch as the rotted corpse of a thing that might have been the man pulled the little girl to pieces. She screams until the thing removes her face, and then they disappear. It is 1979. A breach of containment occurs involving a low-level reality bender who had killed three people in a car prior to being contained by filling their lungs with liquid mercury when they wouldn't let him pass during a traffic jam. The reality bender is shot and killed by Dr. Calvin Desmet, who later investigation would show was defending himself when the entity attacked him. There was, however, no surveillance footage found of the incident, and although the incident took place several floors up, the entity's containment cell seems to have been broken into from the outside. The investigation clears Dr. Desmet, who returns to work. A man lingers on the edge of darkness for just a moment. His body is broken and his eyes burn. He sees the face of a little girl, her eyes bleeding and her hair being pulled back into the black maw of a dead-eyed corpse. He screams her name, but he makes no sound. The vision fades, and suddenly he sees infinitely many little girls, some of them dying, but many more alive growing old and never having to watch as she is consumed by a monster while her father watches, unable to do anything but weep. He sees the monster, the dead-eyed thing, and traces a line in the air between the world that he had left and another world, a world of filth and corrosion and death. He sees, if only for an instant, the thread between the two, a glowing fiber that draws them together. He looks past that thread and sees others, hundreds of thousands, millions, trillions, a number stretching towards infinity that he grasps all at once, and then he follows them down, back down towards his world. In his mind's eye, he cuts the threads. Years later, the man sees the threads again, though not now from the eyes of one tumbling into the darkness. Instead, he sees them from the eyes of a serrated knife. In the moment before he is dragged back into a cage, he reaches out and grabs not just the threads, but the spools where those threads originated. With one deft motion he pulls across them, splitting them and emptying their contents into the void beneath him. The threads disappear. He smiles. The next morning, a note came from within SCP-1322. The translated message was simple. What have you done? The cost of what they had done became evident immediately. A hundred sites, large and small, all reported apparent abductions of valuable artifacts and entities. So many reported, in fact, that the Foundation's central computer determined that they were experiencing a dominance shift and began making preparations to move the records into deep storage. The order was quickly rescinded by Overwatch Command, who later issued a single line of text as acknowledgement of what had happened. The Foundation is currently experiencing unexpected shifts in reality. Do not panic. This did little, however, to assuage the fears of those who had watched as living anomalous entities had been crushed under the weight of something inconceivable into infinitesimally small points before disappearing altogether. Even worse, perhaps, were those who had watched their co-workers experience the same. Hundreds reported to site infirmaries around the globe. Dozens were dead, disappeared as if pulled by a string into another place. The news that morning was undisturbed, save for a few stories that might interest someone with insight. There was an explosion at a chemical plant near Istanbul, though investigators to the scene found nothing except a scorched foundation, a few overturned semi-trucks, and a banner that read, Dr. Wondertainment Incorporated, One Million Safe Man Hours. Billionaire Skidder Marshall had begun a massive sell-off of his holdings, creating a panic in East Asian money markets. The Secretary General of the United Nations had announced the sudden and tragic death of long-serving Undersecretary General D.C.L. Fine, who had perished when her private plane had gone down over the North Atlantic. 
These and other stories littered local and national news the world over, but aside from a few strange incidents and unusual disappearances, nobody seemed to notice. It is hours earlier. Around a table sit 13 people. One of them puts her head in her hand. It still means the end of so many lives. It's, it's too many to even comprehend. A number without limit. Another voice answers, a number without us. There is silence. And then another. We pledge ourselves to maintain normalcy and protect our world. This world. The affairs of other worlds are their own. We would expect any other overseer council to act the same way, in the interest of their universe. This, all of this, the science, the militarism, everything, all of it is to accomplish a single unreachable goal. Keep the monsters tucked out of sight. Now we find out, even that might not be enough, that the end of days is coming for us anyway, but we're given an option. If we do nothing, every universe dies screaming. If we take this action, every universe dies screaming but ours. Once it's over, it's over. Everything we've struggled for, everyone who has died to protect our world will be validated. Is the end of our world not worth this? Is protecting ourselves from the doomsday to come not worth this? 059 shakes her head. You're mad. You're all mad. You've lost your minds. You know nothing about this entity. Nothing about what it's capable of or what it wants. And you're willing to open the only box we've found to put it in? What has happened to you? She stands. You are good men. Intelligent men. Some of the finest men and women I've ever known. But this is madness. I cannot allow it to happen. Even if we manage to somehow survive turning loose an unpredictable... monster, remember today as being the day we gave up on our mission. We secure, and we contain. Those two come first. We've now risked everything for the faintest glimmer of hope that we somehow achieved the last, and I fear it will have damned us. She pauses. Why do you trust it, Ramimund? After all we've achieved, why do you risk everything on this? There's a rustling sound from a dark corner of the room. 051 speaks, but something is strange about his voice. I knew Kelvin Desmond, years ago, in a different life. He wasn't recruited by the Foundation. He volunteered. He was part of a team contracted by the Insurgency to run trials on a new technology they were developing at the time. But he had a young daughter that was killed by SCP-106 when it breached containment during transit in 1975. Years before we had developed functional containment procedures for it. And after that... He sought us out. He never said much about it, but you could tell. If that's him in there, and he had found a way to remove every trace of the anomalous from our universe, no matter the cost, he would do it. I know he would. I can hear it in his voice. 059 spits. In another life, you might have been reasonable. This is unacceptable. The rustling stops. From that dark corner, a man slumps forwards onto the ground. His throat has been slit. He is 051. The rest of them react with a start. 053 turns and draws a weapon. Who? He says, but is cut off when another figure emerges from the shadow. It is 051. He is shaking, and his face is streaked with tears. One arm appears to have been crushed. I'm sorry, the man says, his voice now trembling. I'm sorry. It said that if I came here, and I told you, it would spare my life. It would spare... A gunshot rings out across the chamber. Smoke floats from the barrel of a gun in 053's hand. Inches from 051's face, a bullet hangs in the air. The space around it appears strangely distorted. In seconds, it collapses into a point and disappears. 051 turns towards 053, his face warped with fear. Don't you see? His words are panicked. Don't you get it? You didn't contain him. You just put off the inevitable. He told me that my world would, would be spared, that I would be spared, if I could just convince... Liar! 059 shouts across the room, and she too pulls a gun. Another shot rings out, and she slumps over her desk, clutching her throat. 053 is pointing his gun at her, but he's staring at 051. His eyes are wide. Do you trust him? 051 smiles, but behind the smile is terror. No. He will stop at nothing to achieve what he wants. He has power unlike any I've witnessed. But he... He is still a person. There's something inside him that still thinks. He said... He promised, promised that he would spare us. I don't want to die. 051 turns back toward the rest of them. I propose a vote. The utilization of SCP-001 entity to stave off the end of the world. All in favor. There is silence for a moment. Then together, eight voices speak together. I. 051 nods. Those opposed? Four voices, including one choking through blood to do so, answer together. Nay. 053 stands. 
He paces around the chamber, stopping at three desks. Every time he stops, there is a gunshot. Three bodies hit the ground. He pauses at a fourth, where 059 sits leaning against her chair, gun in her hand. For a moment, their eyes lock. Whatever comes next, he says, his voice catching. It's no longer your battle to fight. 059 glares at him with purified vehemence. She opens her mouth to speak, and through blood and bile, she says two words. Spare me. With a deft motion, she pulls her gun under her own chin and squeezes the trigger. The chair behind her is sprayed with gore as her consciousness is snuffed out. 053 continues to stand over her, unmoving. 051 speaks. 0513 abstains. The measure passes. The rest of them stand and leave the room. 051 is second to last, and 053 lingers a moment longer. Five bodies stand in silent testament to their opposition. The room goes dark. Gun smoke hangs in the air. It is after. 053 stands before the shattered glass of an observation deck. Below him is a machine, furiously humming as it spins and twists around a nebulous cloud of darkness. Behind him is a smear of blood where 051 had been, moments before he was no longer. The structure around him creaks and groans, and small rivulets of water from the river above them now leak through the walls. Without looking away, he speaks. Netzak, can you hear me? A low, electronic voice responds. Yes. You aren't fitted with any sort of personality module, are you? I am not. He sighs. The rest of the staff had been evacuated. He was the only one left. The rest of the overseers had fled, burying themselves underground or fleeing through extra-dimensional portals or, in at least one case, killing themselves. Company would have been nice. How long can we maintain containment of SCP-001, given our current conditions? Netzak responds immediately. Given current conditions, I will be able to maintain stability of the Petrikau Fontaine Array for 119 days, 6 hours, and 47 minutes. Afterwards, the Array will no longer have the structural integrity necessary to contain SCP-001. 053 rubs his forehead. Given the information you've gathered about SCP-001, what do you think the odds are that our backup containment protocols will be able to neutralize SCP-001? Netzak pauses. Given information gathered during containment of SCP-001, it is a certainty that SCP-001 will be undeterred by current failsafes. Full of good news today, Netzak. 053 sits down against a railing. You need to give me something here. I am unable to provide a sufficiently psychologically useful response. 053 waves his hand idly. Yes, I know that. But you can still problem solve, right? You're a problem solving robot. What would you do in my shoes? Netzak pauses again, and does not respond immediately. 053 notices the lights dim overhead, and somewhere far away he can hear a low, droning noise increase in volume. After a moment, it stops. Netzak speaks. All attempts to contain SCP-001 by way of brute force or standard means of containment, short of maintaining the petri cow fontaine array, will fail. SCP-001 has, by methods currently unknown to this system, fused itself with a fundamental essence of the makeup of reality. It cannot be harmed or interfered with physically, as any such force that would oppose it requires the same forces to exist that SCP-001 is now joined to. SCP-001 will breach containment the moment the petri cow fontaine array fails. Nedzak pauses a second time. However, it continues, SCP-001 does appear to be a sentient, sapient creature likely formed out of the death of Dr. Kelvin Desmond during an accident with this facility in 1982. While sentient, sapient creatures are often unpredictable and generally unwilling to compromise, diplomacy has historically been an effective means at bridging gaps between creatures with dissimilar goals and motivations. 053 barks out a laugh. You want me to talk to it? That's my best option? Yes. 053 stands up, still laughing. You are worth the research dollars, Netzak. Honestly, that comment alone was worth every penny. He grabs his coat. How about this? You watch Dr. Desmond. I'm going to go get a drink. And when I come back, I'll go down there and talk to the dark body. It'll almost certainly mean both of our deaths. But it was only a matter of time anyway, wasn't it? He makes a move to the door, but hesitates. You know, I've been thinking about that night in the council chambers. About the ones I put a bullet in. Sort of a turn of fortune for them, wasn't it? He laughs again, more quietly this time. When I joined the Foundation, someone told me to remain an atheist as long as I can, because I'll see so many gods, and they'll all be selling something, but none of them will be the real deal. They said that I'll know the one true god when I see it, 
and to give that god everything at once, because it's the only thing that matters. He starts walking again. That night, I saw God. That night, God wanted me to shoot 059. And by the sound of it, tonight, God wants to talk to me. So hold down the fort, and I'll be back shortly to speak to him. Does that sound alright to you? Nedzak drones out a reply. I am unable to provide a sufficiently psychologically useful response. 053 smiles as he walks out the door. That's what I thought. So that is the end of the Moonrise document. Seems like it gave some context to some of the events that we didn't hear about in just the base document. But I just work here. Well, not really, I'm contained here, but regardless. That is all I have for you today. Now that we've completed part three, part four, which is the final part, will be next. However, it may need to be split into multiple lectures as it is quite long like the rest of these parts. Either way, until then, Knox.